Hello and welcome to lecture number four. The topic today will be classical Greece. There are a few themes to be addressed in this lecture. The rough time period for classical Greece would begin about 776 BC with the first Olympic Games to about 200 BC. This era is characterized by a tremendous amount of warfare, the Persian Wars and Peloponnesian Wars. We'll look at both. Next, we'll see the rise of Alexander the Great and the spread of Greek civilization throughout the entire Mediterranean and even into the Far East. We will begin the study of the era of warfare with the Persian Wars and the response by the different Greek city-states with the creation of the Greek League. The era of the Persian Wars began in 490 BC as the Persian Empire began to expand westward and pose a threat to all the Greek city-states. This map identifies the Persian Empire in Mesopotamia. In the late 5th century BC, Persia, which is the modern-day country of Iran, began to expand westward and posed a threat to Greece. Historically, there had been tremendous division among the different Greek city-states. However, once Persia posed a common threat to everyone, they began to work together with one another. The Greek city-states came together and they formed what was called the Greek League. This involved 31 different Greek polis, or city-states, as they fought against Persia. Athens provided the navy, and Sparta was chosen to lead the military forces. On the right, we see King Leonidas, one of the kings of the, part of the Spartans. One important battle was the Battle of Thermopylae in 480 BC. Persia's forces were led by King Xerxes. They began their march toward Greece in modern-day Turkey, circled here as the city of Sardis, and then they made their way to the Greek mainland. They were stopped at a city called Thermopylae. The movie and graphic novel 300 helps to tell this story of the Battle of Thermopylae in 480 BC. While the 300 Spartan warriors who volunteered for the assignment were defeated, they slowed down the advance by Xerxes' warriors and allowed other Greek city-states to mobilize their defense. Eventually, as a result of their cooperation, the Persian Empire was defeated, and the Greeks were victorious in what were called the Persian Wars. Even though the common enemy of Persia was defeated, this era of warfare continued. Following the defeat of Persia, the Spartans retreated to their traditional policy of isolationism. Then the Athenians tried to establish their own empire and dominate other Greek city-states. This led to an additional conflict called the Peloponnesian Wars. The Peloponnesian War is the name for the civil war among the different Greek city-states. Once again, Sparta dropped its policy of isolationism because they thought, saw the Athenians as a threat. They united with many other Greek city-states to fight against Athens. Sparta once again had the best land forces, while the Athenians specialized in their navy. Another advantage held by the Athenians were the great city walls that protected not only the city of Athens, but their port as well, and they're shown here on this diagram. However, shortly into the war, a plague raged through the city and killed several thousand citizens, including their great political leader, Pericles. Eventually, the Athenians were defeated and they were forced to tear down their walls and destroy their navy. However, this took a great toll on all of the Greeks, not just those residents of Athens. Next, I'd like to look at the rise of two Macedonian leaders who had a major influence on the history of Greece. The first of these Macedonian kings would be Philip II, and he's portrayed here on the right. Well, if I'm going to be talking about Macedonia, I should probably identify where it's located. Here again is that map of ancient Greece, and Macedonia is located to the north of Greece, circled here on this map. While Philip may have been a Macedonian, he was able to amass a huge army, and he conquered all of the different Greek city-states and forced each of them to accept him as their leader by 337 BC. However, he suddenly died the next year. Philip's son was named... Alexander. He assumed the throne upon his father's death. 
and he also retained control of his father's army. I don't know if you've ever seen the film, Alexander. It stars Colin Farrell in the lead role. It's okay. Uh, provides some entertainment, but Hollywood does stretch quite a few things. You may want to watch it, though, uh, as it's one of your possible titles for this class. It turns out that Alexander was a military genius. Over the next 11 years, he led his forces, which covered over 22,000 miles. They never lost a battle. He was always very well prepared, and he often knew the terrain better than its own residents. Eventually, Alexander was able to conquer Persia and Egypt. Not only was Alexander an excellent strategist, he also used some of the latest technologies. As shown here, this is the Macedonian phalanx. It involved an 18-foot-long wooden pike in order to stop the charge of horses. This drawing identifies typical battle formations taken by Alexander's forces. The keys often were the heavy cavalry on either flank and the heavy infantry in the center. One characteristic that made Alexander unique was that once he conquered different areas, he encouraged his men to remain in those conquered territories and intermarry with the people that they conquered. By studying a few maps, we can see the spread of Greek civilization. The purple areas here show the extent of the Greek world prior to Philip and Alexander. Here we see the spread of Greek influence. It's well beyond the modern-day boundaries of the country of Greece and into Iran, Iraq, and even parts of India. It even spread to what's now Egypt. Alexander is referred to as the Great because he created the greatest empire of the ancient world. Let's look now and see what kind of ideals were spread by Alexander to different parts of the Mediterranean and even the Far East. I'd like to begin by looking at a city. The city of Alexandria was founded by Alexander about 331 BC. Here we see another map identifying the military conquests of Alexander. The city of Alexandria is circled here. Initially, Alexandria was designed to be an economic or a trade hub or link between the wealth of Egypt and the rest of the Greek Empire. While it may not have been in the physical center of the Greek world, it eventually became a political, cultural, and intellectual center of the Greek Empire. Two structures ensured that Alexandria would be a city of great significance. The first was the Royal Library. It was the largest and most significant in the ancient world. This ensured the city would be the intellectual center of Greece. It boasted as many as 400,000 volumes of papyrus. Not only that, it included a museum, botanical gardens, and zoo. Scholars from all over the Mediterranean wanted to study in this library. The other structure is shown here. It's the famous Lighthouse of Alexandria, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was nearly 400 feet tall and took over 20 years to build. It was the first lighthouse in the world, and it guided trade ships to Alexandria's significant harbor. Eventually, it was destroyed by earthquakes. Next, we'll look at examples of Greek theater and art. The Greeks had a major impact on the development of theater. It provided a form of entertainment and commentary on society. Masks such as these were very common outside of theaters. Common genres were tragedy and comedy. And the city of Athens was a cultural center for theatrical productions. Here we see a depiction of a typical outdoor Greek theater. They didn't have microphones back then, so the actors' voices had to be heard throughout the theater. As they were designed, acoustics had to be taken into account. Here we see an actual theater and stadium in Delphi. 
In the upper left, we see the theater, and notice how steep the seats are? When I went there, I heard a conversation of the people who were really far from me down below. The acoustics, again, were taken into consideration as this was being designed. If you go to a theatrical production or a sporting event today, you can sit in the cheap seats or a luxury box. They had luxury boxes back then. Notice the seats on the right. There's a higher back and an armrest. These seats cost more money. The Greeks were also known for their sculptures. This one is entitled The Charioteer and it was found in Delphi in the 1890s. Delphi was the location of important chariot races each year, and it's believed that this particular sculpture was outside the stadium. It was bronze, and the level of detail was really amazing. It's possible that it depicts one successful charioteer, but it's unclear. Greek art influenced many different civilizations. Here we see something that's at the Smithsonian in the United States. Can you tell who this individual is? It's George Washington, depicted as a Greek god. Today we hold the Summer Olympics every four years, and the Winter Olympics as well. Well, we get this from the Ancient Greeks. We'll talk about the Ancient Greek Olympic Games next. The first Olympic Games were held in 776 BC, in the city-state of Olympia. They were held in honor of the god Zeus, and it celebrated heroism and the perfection of the human body. Here we see the famous entrance to the stadium at Olympia. On the left is the so-called walkway of shame. Every single person who went to watch one of these events would walk past a series of statues of athletes who had cheated at the Olympic Games. These individuals were reviled and they were treated as outcasts. They were reminders that people should never cheat and never go against the norms of society. Here's the playing field itself. Um, you can see several people are congregated right along the starting line for one of the running races. I ran a very slow 40-yard dash, but it was really cool to think that I was running in the same place as many athletes who had been there in the past. Because the Olympics celebrated the perfection of the human body, most athletes competed in the nude. The pentathlon was one of the more popular events. It involved five games. The broad jump, javelin throw, and discus throw, wrestling, and the stadium. This was a sprint of about 200 yards, probably the premier event of the Olympics. Initially, winners would only receive an olive wreath as a prize, but then the value of what they received increased. Often, a successful athlete from a polis would be, receive a home to live in from the people who lived in their community. They also were treated as heroes over the years. Next, I'd like to look at the contributions of the Greeks in history and philosophy. The individual shown here is Herodotus. He earned the label the father of history. The reason why he received this is because he traveled throughout all of the Mediterranean world and he systematically collected a range of materials and then he wrote his great work. The title was The Histories and it chronicled the Persian Wars. The word philosophy is actually a Greek word. Its meaning is love of wisdom. Several important Greek philosophers influence us today. Pythagoras is one. He was a mathematician and philosopher. He argued that just about everything in the universe could be explained using math and philosophy. Can you think of a theorem that he developed? The word philosophy is actually a Greek word which can be translated to the love of wisdom. There were several important Greek philosophers. One is shown here, and this is Pythagoras. He was a mathematician and philosopher. He believed 
everything in the Earth and Universe could be explained using math. One of the founders of Greek philosophy is shown here, Socrates, or, well, Socrates. This influential Athenian teacher questioned everything, including the Olympian gods. He had quite a following and many students. However, he was found guilty of corrupting youth, and he committed suicide by drinking poison. One final individual is shown here. This is Hippocrates. His famous work was the Hippocratic Corpus, and it addressed many issues involving medical ethics. Today, his legacy is seen with the Hippocratic Oath. In later years, many other Greeks began to dissect corpses. As they did so, they were able to identify many different parts of the human body, including the nervous system, several organs, as well as veins and arteries. They lay the foundation for a lot of medical science today. We covered many topics today. I'd like to review some of the main ideas next. This lecture addressed classical Greece, and it included the age of warfare, as well as the rise of Alexander the Great. What you want to be able to do is you want to be able to write an essay that identifies key events during this era, and you'd like to evaluate the greatest contribution or influence that Greek civilization had on the Western world. Well, that's it for today. I hope you learned something new, and I hope you found it interesting. Have a good day, and we'll see you soon.